All right. How's everybody doing today? Yeah. Wow. So many exciting things going on. But turn with me. You can start getting prepared by going to Romans chapter 12. And I'm preaching on worship. I, I might do this. I'm really excited about it right now. So I, I may do this until Christmas. I don't know. So get ready. We're going to talk about worship. Today I want to talk about some things that may not be commonly heard about worship. I want to just shake a little bit of your thinking. Uh, hopefully uh, not offend anyone. That's not my intention. But I just really want to present something a little bit broader than what we typically talk about worship and American Christianity. Before we do that, though, while you're turning to Romans uh, 12, uh, 1 and 2, I want to talk about this week. What an amazing week it's been. God's done some amazing things in our church. People are being touched, ministered to, all that, and uh, we're so thankful for that. So thankful for this campus and everything that happens here. Friday night, uh, this past Friday night, Joel Osteen was in town. Did anyone go to that? A few of you. Wow, you missed it. It was amazing. It was like, I don't even know what to say about it. It was, uh, it, I, I told Cindy, that's one of the best shows I've been to in a long time. And I say it in all the right ways. I mean, it was, it was this mixture of video, uh, worship, songs, uh, testimony, preaching. Joel preached, Victoria preached. His son Jonathan kind of preached. Uh, Dodie, Joel's mom, preached. I mean, it, was, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was probably uh, two hours long, something like that. And uh, really powerful. But when Joel, Joel was free, I had the fortune of being in the third row. You know, I'm a big Joel Osteen fan. I love Joel. I've, uh, for five years, I listened to him almost daily on uh, Sirius Radio 128 and encourage people to do that. And I tell people all the time, if you listen to Joel for a month, your life will be changed. He, it'll recalibrate his sharing of the word of God. He's had a lot of criticism. You know, anytime you get that big in ministry and he ministers literally to millions of people around the world, of course, you draw criticism. People criticize him because of doctrine. I've never seen that criticism. I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a theologian myself, but I'm also a practical pastoral training. I, I, I love all of it. I really love what he does. He's an encourager. He admits that from the beginning, that if you want deep spiritual understanding of text, you're not going to get it from Joel, but you're going to leave with great hope, you know. So anyway, while he was preaching, I remember he's in Cleveland. He's feeling the whole Cleveland thing. He talked about the Browns a little bit. It's kind of fun. And uh, he starts preaching. And, and uh, twice in the preaching, he gets overwhelmed by the presence of God. One time, I've seen this. I haven't seen it. I've heard it on Sirius Radio. He period, they edit these things out because they have to put it in a 28-minute context. But he, he, his sermons are actually longer than what they are with what you ever hear on TV or radio or whatever. And uh, so they play the uncut versions. He gets overwhelmed a lot. The Holy Spirit just comes and touches him, mainly because of a deep thanksgiving in his heart for where, what God is doing. He's overwhelmed by what God's doing in his life. And you get that when you're, when you're there with him, you know. And so he gets so overwhelmed at this one point in his message that he stops. And he covers his face like this. He's like, oh. I don't know what's going on here. And he's weeping. He's just sobbing. And he, he thinks he's got to gain composure. And he tries to speak again. It hits him again. And he's like, I mean, it was really, and I, I, you know, again, I've seen this happen on the TV and heard it on the radio. And the crowd typically has no mercy on him whatsoever. They're like, more, Lord, more. I mean, they want him to fall on the floor or something. I don't know what they're wanting. So they're just out there, more, Lord, touch him. And he, he just gets overwhelmed. And it, it, it almost always revolves around two topics. It's either about his family and what God did with his dad and his grandfather and then to him and now to his son and his daughter. And, and all of us know that's an overwhelming thing. If, if you've seen the passing of the baton from generation to generation, whether you felt that in your past or not, in one sense doesn't matter. You have an opportunity to pass now to a whole new generation. You can start this thing that God's going to do for generations to come. But that causes him to weep. And also the building that they're in, the compact center, which is the equivalent to the Q, uh, it seats 16,000, is, is their church. And he got the thing for, it was valued at two to $300 million, and he got it for seven, seven million dollars, probably about 10 years ago or so. And the place is packed, they run multiple services, different, you know, uh, Hispanic services, all, all different kinds of services. And so when he talks about that miracle in his life, he gets overwhelmed. 
I forget what he was talking about the other night when this happened, but it hit him, and I just thought, I, just, I mean, I'm yelling. I'm, I know I'm a Joel fan, so I was like, more, Lord. I mean, you know, let him fall on the floor, Lord. This would be great. And so uh, it was such an anointing and a presence of God, and, and somewhere, I don't have the exact numbers, but I looked around, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people gave their hearts to the Lord that night. I mean, stood right up. He, it was a, it, he made it hard. I mean, he said, look, this is easy to get the heart to Jesus Christ, but I want you to take a stand. I want you to, and had them stand up. He gave them three steps that they need to take. He led them through it. And so I, I came out of that really empowered. And then I got home and I was watching this video of Andrew Brunson. How many of you know who Andrew Brunson is? He's the pastor that was in the Turkish prison for two years. Now, Andrew Brunson is a part of the movement that I was formerly a part of, Partners in Harvest. Great movement uh, out of Toronto, Canada. I was on the apostolic team with Heidi Baker, John Arnott, and Mark Dupont. And I left there about, I don't know, about 10 years ago. And, and, and then a few years later, we kind of joined the Bethel, Bethel movement. But I mean, there's a big part of my heart very dear to this movement. Well, Andrew uh, is a part of that movement. His church in Turkey is a partner in Harvest Church. And so this, all that to say, this guy is a Holy Spirit guy, big time. I mean, he's the Georgian Banoff in Turkey. He's the John Arnott in Turkey. I mean, he's, he's, he's plowed the ground over there in a, in a Muslim country and created a church that's right in the city center next to all the various clubs and stuff that people go to. I mean, it's amazing what he's doing. And we've actually, if I remember right, we've contributed money uh, toward them to help them out. But he was arrested for preaching the gospel as a spy terrorist for preaching the gospel. They threw him in prison. We're going to give him a 35-year sentence. And so he was put into prison and thanked the Lord for ACLJ, uh, American Civil, American Center for, Center for Law and Justice, Jay Sekulow, uh, who we, we've been familiar with for 30 years. Uh, he fought for him with President Trump. Trump administration got big time behind it. 66 senators got behind it and signed off saying, we, we want this man set free. No conditions, just set him free. So they've been negotiating for months. And finally, I think it was Thursday or Friday, he got set free. They put him on a plane. He went to Germany. He came to the United States. As soon as he gets off the plane, they take him over to the White House to meet the president. So he goes over to the White House. And this is on my Facebook page. Do not watch it right now, but you need to watch it later on. It's only two minutes long. But Andrew, Andrew Brunson, uh, after his, the talk, we the press conference and all the press are there and Christian leaders are there and everything and everybody's very excited about him being home. He was, I mean, he was, it, it was a torturous two years. That's all I can say. And he doesn't talk much about it, but we got regular updates because I'm a part of Friends and Partners and Harvest still as a, as a member, not as a leader, but as a member. And I get these emails and so, you know, and I think we mentioned it here several times publicly to pray for him. And finally, he's been released after two years. But I mean, the, the brokenness that would be in your heart, this is not an American prison. American prisons are very difficult, I understand. This is a Turkish prison. But there's movies that have been made about Turkish prisons. Uh, you know, I, I don't wanna get into the details, but it, they're notorious. And so he's in that prison in a Muslim country as a Christian pastor. You can only imagine the difficulty and the challenge. So we need to pray for him. But anyway, he goes to the White House and, you know, he does the thing with the president, you know, and, the, you know, there's all political stuff there, you know, where, you know, we worked hard to get this happen, here it is, and that's what, that's what politicians do, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what happened is Andrew, all of a sudden, at the end of it, says, Mr. President, can I pray for you? And, and Trump has always been open to prayer. I got to say that about it, President Trump. And so he, he said, yeah, sure. And he gets in the prayer mode, you know, Trump, he kind of bows his head, and, and, uh, Andrew gets on his knees, and it's kind of funny if you watch it. It's like the president, I don't know if the president thought he was supposed to get on his knees too. He's a little like, well, you know, I don't know what to do here. And, uh, and he lays hands on, on President Trump, and he speaks the most magnificent prayer and blessing. In fact, the commentators that I was watching were, were weirdly astounded by it. They said, that was amazing. Well, that was just a, an, that's like, I th they're, there's what they said. I think this is a first. Now, we know a lot of people prayed for the presidents over the years, but it was, there was a dynamic to this that was a little bit different. We're talking about a guy who uh, is of our ilk, a guy who really 
calls for the Holy Spirit to come in very powerful ways. And the first thing he said was, I asked Holy Spirit would just come upon you, Mr. President. I mean, I thought he was gonna fall over on the floor. That was what my anticipation was. This would be a Joel Osteen moment, you know. All of a sudden, President Trump would grab his face. It didn't happen, but anyway, what happened was, and then he began to minister to the president and ask the Lord to give him wisdom. And I mean, this is a, and you know why his words were powerful? His words were powerful because of the sacrifice upon his life. You know, he could have said the same words before prison, and everybody would go, well, it's a pastor, he's doing what he does, you know. But now, because of the fragrance of Christ off of this man who has suffered in a Turkish prison for two years, he comes out, and it's like every word is dripping with the presence of God, you know. I pray that it continues in his life, and he becomes a revivalist in this country, and also over in Turkey, and or over in the Euroasia area, even over into the Middle East. I think God's gonna use him in a powerful way. He just needs a time of recovery. And so he's, he's ministering and it's, it's, there's power to it. There's anointing to it. You can feel it. You can see it as, as he did it. And I thought it's because of the sacrifice. Let me submit something to you. Let me share something in the next few minutes. The greatest worship we have, do not hear what I'm not saying. The greatest worship we have is not the singing here on Sunday morning. That's awesome. It's very Davidic. It's a Davidic worship. It's, it's heavenly. It's beautiful. But in some ways, it's easier to get into a place like this where people commonly understand what you're doing in worship. I mean, they're here like, oh yeah, man, I'm here for that too. Woohoo! Hallelujah. You know, we sing, we sing to the Lord, you know. All the songs grip us powerfully and everything. There's nothing wrong with that. It's very powerful. And I think it's biblical, actually. And it's historically accurate to do that. We've, we've jazzed it up because we have technology and all that stuff. It's just a new form of expressing yourself. But biblically, the understanding of the greatest worship is the yielding of your very life to the Lord Jesus Christ in daily martyrdom unto the Lord. Where you daily lay down your life before the Lord as a living sacrifice before the Lord. It becomes a sweet smelling aroma that arises in the heavens. That song we used to sing and we do still sing it sometimes is, you provide the fire, I'll provide the sacrifice. Remember that song? And then how's the chorus go? Fill me up, Lord. Is that it? Fill me up, Lord. I love that song, though, because it really speaks of that partnership of heaven and the earth. The Lord has the fire waiting. He's saying, lay some living meat on the altar. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are the living meat. <laughs> I don't know how, what this means euphemistically, but you're the turkey. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you and say, you are the turkey. <laughs> you are the chicken. <laughs> That's right, we're chickens and turkeys. Laid on the altar of God. What is that? That's an Old Testament reference. It's actually one of the strongest old Pauline Old Testament references regarding sacrifice where he's taking ancient Jewish sacrificial offerings, and he's bringing it over into a contemporary post-cross, post-resurrection, early church context saying, you still give sacrifices unto the Lord. Traditionally, in Jewish understanding, there were two main sacrifices. One sacrifice was the, <coughs> excuse me, the sin offering unto the Lord. Let me tell you, that offering has been absolutely completed in Jesus Christ and his shed blood. Your sins have been eradicated, have been covered, have been cast into the deepest sea because of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It is not by works that we are saved. It's by grace we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. You align yourself with what he did. You become a resurrected person in Jesus Christ. It's settled. It's over. No need for sin offerings. No chickens up here right now. No beef, no bulls, no offering of any sort except the Thanksgiving offering. The Thanksgiving offering is referred to still in a post-Jesus environment because it's reserved for Christians now to continually offer themselves up to the Lord, not for access to heaven, not for access to forgiveness in Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves up to the Lord because of the gratefulness and thankfulness in our hearts, and we do it regularly, we do it daily. We do communion every Sunday. We started about 15 years ago. 
This became a conviction of mine. In the early church in the first century, you must understand, they absolutely believed kind of in a Catholic way. And, and Protestants get kind of tickled by, oh, Catholics. Oh, oh, oh. They think that the bread is actually the body of Jesus. <laughs> we know it's a symbol. Well, in the first century, they didn't think that way. In the first century, when they came together, and by the way, the time, this is really important. I, I don't want to get too far off here. Cindy, let me know if I get too far off. <laughs> communion as we know it was at the end of their service in the first century. It was the apex. It was the climax of worship unto God. That we would take the bread, we would take the drink. And, and by, it's so strong in the first century, Paul warns us about it. He says, look, basically he says, don't, don't do this if you're an unbeliever. Because many have grown sick or fallen asleep because of it. Amen. Now, falling asleep is, is a euphemism. It doesn't make you tired right. for death. Amen. And so for what brings life to one brings death to another. So you know what they did in the early church? When it came time for communion, they dismissed unbelievers. How awkward is that? Any of you who do not know Jesus Christ, you can know him right now. But if you have not been baptized, you need to leave now. That's, that's seeker sensitivity, isn't it? Well, we did that today. Everyone who's not been baptized, please leave. We're gonna take communion now. I mean, wouldn't it kind of create curiosity in your heart? Like, what goes on there? I mean, there's just bread and wine up there. What's the deal, you know? But because they saw it as so safe, it was a protection for those that were unbelievers. Said, so, so now, I mean, we, we kind of have opened the gates and, and probably to the extent that needs to be pulled in a little bit that if your children or you have not been baptized, you probably shouldn't take communion. I mean, if we wanna be biblical, and I think we all do. You say, because you do it so in great reverence knowing that you've been baptized in the Lord. Now in the first century, this was huge. And so they understood the sacrificial aspect of it, that we are moving in deep worship before the Lord. We are believing that, this, that the presence of God is in the bread and in the drink. And so when we come up, it's not like, you know, something's wrong with the drink today. Oh, the bread's kind of stale a little bit. I mean, we don't do that kind of stuff. But we do that in our worship, though. We say, well, our worship was kind of a six today rather than a 10. I mean, I wish it was a 10. We did do my favorite song, you know, the top 40 songs that are going. We have this stuff about worship that is nowhere in the Bible. So we're in the Bible, in the, in the New Testament and Old Testament concept, worship, I, I'm not saying that it's not about expressions of thanksgiving to God, but worship really was about your reasonable sacrifice unto God. Yeah, three people agreed with that. The daily laying down of your life is true worship to the Lord. I mean, it's really not hard to come. Oh, this sounds negative. I feel coming on me right now. And I, so I got to pull it back out of there. I don't want to be negative, but I want to speak truth in the midst of it. That, that in the context of understanding of scripture, we daily worship the Lord through our very lives and our actions. In fact, you'll see in Romans 12 here in just a minute, that's absolutely true. And not only is it absolutely true, but then Paul begins to unpack what that looks like in the verses following. I don't have time to go through with those, but if you wanna go home and, and study those in Romans 12, it's helpful because it says, it says if, you're, if you prophesy, then do it. If you're a teacher, then do it. If you're a servant, then do it. If you're generous, then do it. Whatever your gift is, whatever that capacity, whatever vessel that you have inside of you, yield it to look. God is big on vessels. I'm not going to talk about it today, but I will next week. He loves vessels. I mean, he loves, he loves responding, reacting to every move in faith in your life. That's why when you supply the you supply the fire, Lord, I'll supply the sacrifice. The sacrifice attracts heaven. In the Old Testament, when they laid that meat on the offering or whatever it was that they were laying there and calling unto the Lord, the fire would come down and consume it. You want the fire of God? Live a sacrificial life. Even your giving of offerings, you understand, like worship technically, I could get in a lot of trouble for this. I've seen people get in trouble for this, but I really believe it. Technically, worship is unto the Lord, but not for the Lord. I mean, the Lord's not up there like, I need your worship. I've had a really difficult week. Cindy, please lift your hands. 
If you lift your hands, I'll have more power. He's not doing that. God is all sufficient without us. He created us for companionship. He wants to walk with us. He loves us. He wants to see us do amazing things. He, he's like a, he's a father. He's a father that gets, we are his children. He, he's excited about you. You're cute. Turn to the person next to you in faith and say, you're cute. Just tell him that. If it's someone you're dating, this could work out real well. You're cute. Cindy, you're cute. I'm distracted there. So it's not for the Lord, but it's like everything the Lord does, when he calls us to do something, it is for our own good. I mean, he, he doesn't ask us to do anything without it actually it benefits us. If you love your enemies, you're going to have less enemies. So he's not up there like, whoa, this is empowering me when you do. I mean, worship is when you focus on Jesus, you change. When you give your life to Jesus, you change. When you create a personal culture, listening, responding what Jesus has called you to do, you get transformed in the midst of it. When you give in the offering, when you tithe in faith, this is what's amazing about it. You know, the Lord says this. The Lord doesn't say, when you tithe, I'll be happy. And I'm really happy about that. So you need to do it. It's a, tra a tradition brought, brought up 400 years before the law ever existed. It's kind of like the Sabbath. The Sabbath has existed since the beginning of time. Since Jesus took the seventh day off. If you, if you honor the Sabbath, I mean, it pleases the Lord. But if you honor the Sabbath, uh, it brings benefit to you. If you're obedient to your parents, you live a long life. If you sow your tithes, these are just promises of the Lord. Sow your tithes and your offerings and get a generous heart upon you. When you do that, I mean, it's in faith. It's like, how am I going to do 10%? I, I'm barely living on what I make right now. And, but you don't understand. See, and I, I, I get that. I understand. You know, I've tithed since I was 10 years old. So I'm, I, you know, I've got this culture, a personal culture. That's the first thing I think of when, any, when I give any money in any way is that I got to give 10%. I need to sow 10%. I, I give this unto the Lord. Well, he doesn't, he's not up there saying I'm a little low on cash. Could you give a little more this week? I mean, we're doing some stuff in Pakistan and Iran right now. It costs money. See, the Lord's not doing that. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So he's up there and empowered. It's not like I need money, I need money, I need money. We need money down here. But when you sow and you release that 10%, it engages something in heaven. It's a, it's a, it's a living sacrifice on an altar. And when it does, it attracts fire. Boom. In this case, it attracts a flood. <laughs> he said, test me in this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. This is what he's saying. Like, you yield, you put the sacrifice on the offering. See if I will not pour out on you something so massive you will not be able to contain it. He reiterates it in Luke chapter 6 and says, give and it shall be given unto you. So we give to the Lord and boom, it comes, it's reciprocity. It comes right back. Reciprocity, reciprocity is a huge principle in the kingdom of God. So when you worship the Lord, he's not up there, oh, yes, more, more. No, no. When you do that, it opens something in heaven of the fire and the power of God in your situation, especially the more severe the situation is, as you worship the Lord, the more severe the situation is, the greater the sacrifice and the greater the reward that comes on you. Everybody understand that? A couple people do. <laughs> Bless them, Lord. <laughs> give Donald Trump that thing they got right there, Lord. Just give it to him. <laughs> So, let's go back to the scripture here. Romans chapter 12. All right, did I do okay, Cindy? I didn't go too far off today. Romans 12, all right. <laughs> Romans 12, verse one and two. I beseech you. That's a real fancy New Testament word for I urge you. I beg you. Brethren, by the mercies of God, you listen to these words. I highlighted them in my Bible. 
you present your bodies. So there's something you can do with your body that opens heaven up. You present your bodies a living, not dead, all the, the altars in the Old Testament, they, they didn't put living cows on the altar. It was dead cows. It's, it's, it's dead bulls. It's dead chickens. It's dead vegetables. It's dead whatever. It's not living anymore, except Isaac. Isaac was a picture of Christ. His hand was held back from sacrificing his son. God's hand was not held back, the father, and sacrificed his son, Jesus Christ. It's the only one in the Old Testament. Jesus becomes the great exemplar of sacrifice. He laid down his life for you so that you could receive salvation through Jesus Christ. But if you follow the life of sacrifice to the Lord, you get the reward that is given through Jesus Christ daily in your life because it opens heaven, because you're responding to the Lord, you're worshiping the Lord, you're giving the Lord, you're laying down your very life. It opens up an amazing uh, opportunity for transformation in your life. So in Romans 12, it says this, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not, oh, let me, let me stop on that bit, which is your reasonable service. Biblically, if you look up those terms, and some versions get this right, actually. King James is a little light on this one, New King James. It says, uh, which is your spiritual worship. Your spiritual worship is laying down a living, sacrificial, holy, acceptable to God life. When you do that, it opens something up in the heavens. Do not be conformed to this world. See, this huge pressure for confirmation, uh, conformity, conformity in our lives. Conformity through social media or whatever. We're constantly trying to, in, in, in an American worship, let's just call it, American worship has become a massive industry. And we don't realize it. I mean, the songs you sing right now, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this. I just think we have to be aware and beware of what's going on. American worship has basically gone around the world. So when I'm in Germany, they're speaking, they're singing American worship songs in English. And so they, they don't know fully what they're saying. They do have the, you know, the translation up there underneath, you know, but they're singing, they're kind of bound to English singing because German songs have not been written of the quality of what they want. And that's, that's true all around the world. So you look at it and you go, are we, have, have we created a sub culture within the greater kingdom understanding that exalts music above all other forms of worship. You know what I'm saying? It's a little scary right now, I know. Is true worship to the Lord, not that that's untrue, but it's, if you talk about worship with any American Christian, they immediately think of certain songs that are popular around the United States. But I believe, we're, I, I just want to prophesy, we're about to go into a season of time an epoch, a, a season of history where there's gonna be a simplicity of worship, yet it's gonna be heavily anointed and it's gonna to speak to people in certain ways and powerful ways that they understand that Sunday is just a culmination of the rejoicing and thanksgiving of what God has done during the week and a pivoting, because it's, it's, it's a first day and a last day, depending on how your understanding is. It's a pivoting from the past into the future the next week. It's an empowering and an emboldening of the people of God to be sacrificial in what they do throughout the week, which creates this beautiful fragrance that rises up to the Lord. You know, my granddaughter, Josie, she's three and a half years old. I throw grandchildren's stories in every week. That's what you do when you're a grandparent. Josie's three and a half years old. She was with her father at the store this week. And all of a sudden, she looked up at her dad and said, Dad, uh, we need to buy some flowers for our neighbor. And Jay says, what, what do you mean? She goes, I, I feel that they need to know that we love them. She's three and a half years old. And he said, oh, okay, God bless Jay, man. A lot of parents would go, oh, no, honey, that's fine. They, you know, they, we, we don't have the money to buy that or whatever, you know. Jay says, okay, so he buys flowers. She goes, I think they'd like a brownie too. 
The first one I think was the Lord. The second one, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's like a little package brownie, you know? And they uh, go home and go across the street. Across the street from them is a neighbor that they've had some difficulty with. That, that it wouldn't be the people they give flowers to typically. But their daughter wanted to go over there. They went over there. They weren't home. Whew. So Jay said, why don't we go to the elderly neighbor that lives next to us? Josie said, okay. So they go over there. Jay explains the story to this lady. She's wondering why these people are there with a brownie and some flowers. <laughs> you know, you provide the old lady. <laughs> we provide the brownie. I mean, I don't know. It's a, but it's, it's a heart of sacrifice before the Lord. And so Jay turns to Josie, three and a half years old, and said, tell the lady why we're bringing this. And she said, because I wanted you to know that we love you. This lady is overwhelmed. Tears come to her eye. A three and a half year old understands that. Josie may not know a lot of worship songs, but I just sense beyond the, the fragrance of the brownie, there's the presence of the Lord that arises off that into heavenly places because somebody at three and a half years old got it in their head that we are sacrificial toward those that are living nearby and they need to understand that Jesus loves us. Now, if that is not a living sacrifice, I don't know what is, but let me read you out this, out this passage. I'm gonna close with this in just a minute. Romans 12, one and two, out of the Passion Translation. If you do not have one of these, I encourage you to get one. It's a great expression of the emotion of God. And uh, yeah, you just, I mean, it, it unpacks these, these verses. It's kind of like the Amplified in my generation, uh, but I think it's even a little better. In Romans 12, verse one and two, just what we just read, listen to this. This is right from the Aramaic understanding in the context of what was understood about the Aramaic at the time of Christ. There you go. Verse one, beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? Question mark. I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifice. This is not talking about Sunday morning. This is talking about your daily life. And live in holiness. See, that's what he sees as the sacrificial life. Live in holiness. In other words, avoid sinful activities and environments that are going to pull you away from Jesus Christ. So he says, live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. Isn't that awesome? All that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. It's not about you singing over people at work. They're probably not going to receive that. You know, I don't know what the latest song is, but I guess, you know, uh, wrestle, or, uh, Reckless Love is probably a big one, you know. It chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I mean, I, that's powerful for us. I don't know what that'll do to a person at work. But your service, sacrificial love, your sacrificial giving, your sacrificial honoring of them brings about very powerful things. And by the way, the following verses cover all of that. But let's just look at this for a minute. He says, for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Verse two, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. That's be not conformed, but be you transformed. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. Wow. Listen to this. I love this part. This will empower you. I mean, this empowers you. This empowers you. <laughs> Singing empowers you. But your service in love is the sacrificial, to, uh, sacrificial offering to the Lord will empower you in a great way. It says, this will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life. Satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Yeah. Woo! I don't know about you. I want to live a beautiful life, man. Yeah. In the first century, when they got together, Cindy text uh, Middleburg Heights, tell him I'm running late. <laughs> Let's just laugh at that. <laughs> in the early church, I'm going to get into this more next week. In the early church, their worship was very different than ours. First and second century were kind of similar. This is a Jewish sect 
that becomes its own faith called Christianity. So of course, in the first century, it highly reflects Judaism. It's, it, the early church services were designed basically following the synagogue, which was their gathering place. It was like a, a synagogue was like a, an outpost of the temple in places where people couldn't get to the temple. And so there's this outpost where they would get together, community, family, people, many of them not religiously trained, and they would spend time. The first thing they would do is they'd open the Torah. They would read from a passage in the Torah. And by the way, the Catholic Church is actually still moving in a similar order to what the first century church did. So just so you know, they didn't have to be moved by amazing worship. They didn't have to be moved by a light show. They didn't have to be moved by any of this. I'm not saying those things are wrong. I think they're cultural and they add to our expression. They move to our soul and all that stuff. But not, you know, you, you can survive not a Sunday morning worship. You can still survive the next week. If you are tuned in to a sacrificial lifestyle of sacrificing to those around you and unto the Lord, the power and the fire and empowerment of God will come upon you. You'll be encouraged all throughout the week. You come on Sunday, not only to receive, you come on Sunday to give. You're there to say, wow, I wonder who's here today that really needs my encouragement. I wonder who's here today that I can serve, that I can love on, I can take out the lunch to five guys or something like that. I can get them a burger and they're gonna love it. I mean, who can I, that's, that's what it's about. It's not here like, oh, I'm running on fumes, man. Someone hook me up, give me some fuel. I'm about to, to die. I get, I have those Sundays too. But you are the temple of the Lord. You carry the ark of the covenant within you. It is marked with the blood of Jesus over you. You have everything in you. This thing called church, the gathering out, is for us to get together and encourage. It is really a pep rally. We get together, we stir one another, and we say, get out there and do the sacrificial life of Jesus. <laughs> so the early church, they said, there's no big like, Five, four, three, two, one, it's starting. <laughs> they gathered together in homes, they gathered together, all kinds of stuff. And they came together and they, they read from the Torah. But in the New Testament, they shifted from the Torah and they read from the apostles' memoirs. The Gospels. That's what they called them. The apostles' memoirs. Let's read the book of John. John was later, I don't know if they even had it yet. Luke. The physician, you all have heard of him. He has a great account of Jesus. Let's read from that. Let's also read from the Psalms. When they got done, someone would get up and give a little sermon. It could be a number of people that were designated in that way to give a sermon. They'd give a sermon and then they would, they would spend some time with chants to the Lord. Most of them did not have musical instruments. They wouldn't have known how to tie it in. Of course, psalms were powerful. They loved to sing the psalms. But let me just give you an example. Uh, turn with me to Ephesians 5 real quick. I just want to show you one of them. There's a bunch of them, about five in the New Testament. These are first century hymns. This helps you to know what they did and what they considered worship to be and what they really felt worship to be. Worship was, was a worship on a Sunday or a gathering with God's Christians was a portion of worship. It was an expression of worship. Let's say 10%. But the 90% over here was their daily sacrificial life unto the Lord. It's what they did in serving others, loving others, praying for others, ministering to others. That was their worship to the Lord. And either fragrance arose off of that or it didn't. And if it did, it attracts heaven and attracts the favor of God upon their lives. So it says later on in Romans chapter 12. But Ephesians 5 says this. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Let's stand up together. That was a first century hymn. So here's how they did it. And then whoever's coming up to finish can uh, come on up. So the leader of the service in the first century, whether it was in a home or wherever, at this point in the service, right before they take communion, right after the sermon, this was their worship service. They had no sound systems to turn on. They had no video screens to read. They had none of that. The leader would just say something like this. They would sing in a, a chant type way and they'd go, awake you who sleep. And the crowd would repeat that. Go ahead. No, sing it. Awake you who sleep. Very good. 
Arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. They'd do that over and over again. They would say, awake you who sleep. Rise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. They'd say it over and over again. They'd kind of sing that. That was it. People go home and it get in their head. It's like programming the very soul. So during the week, they're like, awake you who sleep. Come on, Steve, wake up. Rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I mean, there's five of them in the New Testament. They typically speak about the works of Christ and who Christ is. Very Jesus-focused. That's why some of our deepest, most favorite songs are Jesus-focused songs. Why? Because it impacts our soul differently than other songs. Not that other songs are bad. We need songs that rally us together and we're going out to fight and we're doing the work of the Lord and all those kinds of things. But when you focus on Jesus, that's why, you know, the old song, Majesty, the chorus, was so popular for like 25 years because it was just majesty, worship his majesty. I forget the rest of the words, but I used to know them in the 80s. We're singing those songs out. Any song that we sing right now that is directly, we're doing one right now, What's that one you, oh, Ethan's not here. <laughs> the one Ethan wrote, very, very directful, thankful. It's, it's offerings of thanks to the Lord. Lord, you're magnificent. You're powerful. When you recognize the Lord, it's not, it's not feeding the Lord. It's, it's transforming your, it's, it's aligning your heart with who Jesus is. And when you align your heart with Jesus is, the love line of heaven connects with your heart. You're already forgiven. You're going to heaven. This is about surviving and thriving on planet earth. And you, you offer your sacrifice to the Lord. We're going to do that. In fact, I, I, whoever's coming up now, who's coming up right now? Yeah, Joel, come on up here. Makes me feel better. All right. Maybe we should worship the Lord a minute. But there's gonna be souls saved right now. There's gonna be people coming into the kingdom. There's gonna be people restored right now. Why? Because we're gonna we're gonna lift up to the Lord. We're gonna be empowered by God, and we're gonna we're gonna get a rhythm in our lives that says when you sacrifice in accordance with what God's called us to do, somehow heaven opens up. The fire of God comes into my heart, and I'm transformed. It burns up the stuff that needs to be burned up. You know, in a week you collect things that need to be burned. And it purifies the stuff that is meant to stay. Gold, silver, precious stone. I'm having a Joel Osteen moment right now. Just kind of hold your hand out, palm up. Ancients in the first century believed that if your palms were up, it signified openness and thanksgiving. Literally, physically, when you open your palms up, it transforms the upper part of your body to be open, vulnerable before God, even in a natural situation, put your hands up. I mean, you do it. It's vulnerability. I can't touch my weapons. I have have no power. I release to you, Lord Jesus. I release to you right now. Lord, I pray for sacrificial lives to emerge like Andrew Brunson. Sacrificial lives will emerge, Lord God, that we are daily looking for places to sacrificially love one another. And I pray, Lord, out of Cleveland, Ohio, greater Cleveland, an aroma of not just Sunday, but daily sacrifice to the Lord will rise up. We bless that, Lord. Just just begin to worship the Lord. Jay, lead us in something real quick, and then then, uh, Joel's gonna 